In Ephesians 3, 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. I bow my knees before the Father. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And can I have an amen? That's him. That's it. That's it. Verse 14, back in verse 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. That's the position that we need to take. That's the position of someone who knows this God, who knows what we've been singing about. It is the position of being on our knees. I bow my knees before the Father. You know, we, we, we talk about taking a knee, and unfortunately, taking a knee has become a, uh, a sign for show or a sign of disrespect. You know, when I was playing ball, we, the coach would come in there, many of y'all can relate, and he'd say, you know, take a knee, and we'd all come around, and that means he was going to talk to us a while, and we'd, we'd take a knee before him, and we'd listen to what he has to say. And so taking a knee is a, a position of listening. It, it ought to be a, a position of, of respect. But understand that he, when he's talking about in Ephesians 3.14, when he says, I bow my knees, he's talking about something far deeper than that and even more meaningful from that and even more humbling and, and worshipful uh, than that. Matter of fact, the word there, uh, to bow, it means to, to get low. When he's talking about, I bow my knees, he's not just talking about, you know, this idea of, of, of taking a knee. He's talking about getting on your knees before God. And, he's ta- and, and really what, he, what he's talking about there, you see, the, the Jews, their normal position for praying uh, according to the Jewish books that you read about. With it. Their normal position of praying was to stand, sometimes with hands lifted up. They would stand before God, and, 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 and that's the way that they would pray. So Paul's kind of going and bucking the trend here. Paul's taking it even deeper. You know, the, and I'm thankful for the Old Testament. By the way, we're in the book of Leviticus in our engaged Bible reading, and Leviticus is probably my least favorite book in the It's got some gross stuff in there, you know, uh, that, he, that he's talking about and stuff. And so I'm thankful that we don't live in the Old Testament. Amen? <laughs> I'm thankful for the new. And things change. And things change not only in, in form and in function, but things go far deeper in the New Testament. And so Paul was not satisfied with just standing there praying. He said, listen, for this reason, because of this Jesus, because of what he has done, and because of who he is and because of my relationship with him, I've got to get on my knees before him. I've got to come down on my knees. That's that's the position of the Christian. I I tell you, the Jews would do that. But have you ever seen, what actually what he's kind of picturing here, what this word means, have you ever seen the Muslims pray? They, They, five times a day, a devout Muslim will pray. And they don't stand up and they don't sit in a, a lazy boy recliner and pray. Although that you can pray anywhere you are. You can pray driving down the road if you want to. But when they have their times of prayer, and the, by the way, the religion is all in vain. When they have their times of, of, of prayer, praying to a God who does not exist, trying to appease a God who, who's not even real, 
They get down on their, they don't just get down on their knees and do this. They, they get what this word pictures, to be prostrate. They get down on their knees and they put their hands out and they get down on all fours and put their faces on the ground and pray to a God who does not exist. And actually, that's what Paul is saying he's doing here. I bow my knees before the Father. I come before him. I uh, heard Adrian Rogers. Y'all know who Adrian Rogers is? He's gone home to be with, be with Jesus. He is pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee for years. He is uh, probably uh, one of the most well-known, one of the most gifted preachers in all the Southern Baptist Convention over the years. He is a uh, great man of God. Uh, but he shared this story and, uh, about, you know, other than the time that he was saved, the time that God did, made the greatest change in his life. And it was after he had, he had just gotten married and he was praying about the call to preach and was feeling that pull in his heart and in his life. And where he was living at that time, there was a, a, um, a school that was close to him and had a, a, a football field with a track around it, and you know, just like many football fields do. And, and he would go out, and that's the way he would pray. He'd go out and walk. I um, that's, I, I, I move around a lot when I pray, even in my office and things like that. There are times when I get on my knees, but I move around. And so that's what he was doing. He was walking around. And this is what he, he was, he was just kind of overwhelmed with the, the possibility that God would want to use him. And, and he just, he didn't understand that. And so he's praying, he's saying, you know, God, why would you want to use me? But if you want to use me, then I guess I'm here for you. And as he's praying and, and, that, and the Holy Spirit was working in his life, he said that he all of a sudden, he found himself in the middle of that football field praying to God and that he got to the point where he just got down on his knees before God and said, God, I'm nothing. I can't do this. And that God just humbled him even more and he got down on his face before God and praying. And he said as he was praying and realizing how unworthy he was, how incapable he was, how there was nothing that he could do, he said he found himself just digging in the dirt, just digging in the dirt to put his face down even lower and saying, God, I cannot do this without you. If this is what you want me to do, Lord, just use me. I am yours, but I am nothing without you. And something changed in his life. God, and I t the, the thing about a Adrian Rogers was a gifted preacher, an eloquent speaker. He had that deep baritone voice, sounded like God whenever he preached. But if you've ever met Adrian Rogers person to person, what you come away saying is, that is a man who is humble. That is a man who is truly denying himself so that Jesus can work through him. That's the position that God has called us to. He calls us to bow our knees before him. And that's what I, I want us to talk about. I want us to talk, first of all, that this bowing our knees before the Father that is the position of worship. Now listen, there are times for dancing. David danced before the Lord. There are times for shouting. There are times for singing at the top of our voice. But worship, the primary position of worship is to bow our knees before the Father. Because worship's not about what we want. Worship is about giving him what he deserves. If the focus is upon him. And that's what he says here. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees for, before the Father. Now listen, Paul, Paul's saying 
Um, we, we, and when he was in, in, the, in the jail there in Philippi, he sang and, and he talked some about singing and stuff. And there are times when to sing. But when Paul, if there was ever a man of worship, it was Paul. But he, taught, he, he found himself more on his knees before God than he did singing songs. Because that was the, that's the primary position of worship, to bow our knees before him. See, he bowed his knees before us, before the one, first of all, the one who brings us in. That's the one that's worthy of our worship. That's the one that we bow for before, the one that brings us in. Look there in, in verse 15 where he says, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Understand what he said. When he says the word family there, it, the, the word's translated family, but that word literally means for everyone that is of the Father. That's what he's talking Do you realize you have been saved and redeemed and brought into the family of God? You belong to him. We, we are so unlike God. We're, we're so rebellious. We're so sin-filled. And yet God looked down and has forgiven us and redeemed us. That's what he, when he says for this reason in the book of Ephesians, that's what he just spent chapter 1 and 2 talking about. Is this great, glorious, redeeming, soul-saving, soul-changing God. He has brought us in. Look at it in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 where he makes this statement there where he says, In him, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood. We were just singing about it earlier. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. That, that, that's our God. That's what he has done for us. And then in chapter two, he talks about how we were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God, glory. That, that's why we bow before him. But God, rich in mercy, and because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and, and se uh, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And Paul says, for this reason, I bow on my knees. That's it. He's brought us in. It's the position of worship, not only because of the one who has brought us in, but also because of the one who gives us all. He's not only forgiven us, he's given us a glorious inheritance among the saints. He has blessed us in so many. He says there in, in verse 16 of uh, Ephesians 3 there, he says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you. And then he begins talking about all these things. You see, our God is a giving God, and he doesn't just give us what we ask for. He gives us things that we don't even know to ask for. He is a giving God. He is a glorious God. He gives us, a, he gives us heaven. We have the heaven awaiting on us one day. And I tell you, I've been to a lot of funerals here lately. I'm, I'm, I'm hungry for heaven. <laughs> and, I, and I look forward to heaven. But not only has he given us heaven, he's given us glory now. He's given us victory now. He's given us joy now. He's given us a relationship with God now. He gives us all of these things. Listen, the devil comes along and he says, anything but God. Bow before anything but God. But I tell you what, a child of God that knows who Jesus is and what he has done for him says, nothing but God. No, I will bow before no one but God. Nothing else will do. That's the position of worship. But let me tell you, on your knees is not just the position of worship. It's 
It's also the position of warfare. Trey was talking about that earlier. Matter of fact, he's been talking about it with our college students in the battle for the mind. And, and we've been, on Wednesday nights with our adults, we've been going through a study on uh, and looking at how to share our faith. And we've got a couple of more Wednesday nights that we're going to be looking at that. And then we're going to begin moving into a study on spiritual warfare. Because you understand what spiritual warfare is. It's not just the bad things that happen around us. Spiritual warfare is the enemy coming after your heart. He attacks our hearts. That's why I'm going to call the study heart attack. Because we need to learn how to protect our hearts. And let me tell you the best way you can protect your hearts is to bow on your knees before the Father and adoration for him. This is how I fight my battles. It's not just like we're talking about with the Philistines. Jonathan didn't need swords and weapons and all. He just needed God. And so we bow before the one who gives the victory. And this is how not only we fight our battles, this is how we win our battles. That's how, how Joshua won. Joshua did not win any victory. We talk about the great military mind of, of Joshua. All Joshua did was what God told him to do. God brought the victory. David understood this. Who killed Goliath? It wasn't David. David said himself, he said, the God whom you're uh, speaking against, the God whom you're blaspheming, Goliath, he's going to take you down. That's who did it. Matter of fact, David said, this is how I fight my battles. We sang about it this morning. He said, I just pull up at the table with my shepherd because you have prepared me a table in the presence of my enemies and you fight my battles for me. That is the worship. Look at what he says uh, here in, in verse 16, as he says, he is the one that is able to tear down. It says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, what power is he talking about? That word power is the word dunamis. It is explosive power. It's talking about altering power, destroying power. He's talking about warfare is what he's talking about that we would be strengthened with that type of warfare, explosive power. You understand, the, the Bible talks about the enemy being a destroyer. And he is, he is a destroyer. But the enemy is also a builder. And if you open up areas of your life to the enemy, he will begin building things in your life that will destroy you. He, he heaps guilt upon us. And builds mountains and mountains of guilt. He heaps shame upon us. When we allow it to come into our life, he lies to us. He builds these things. In our, he builds more and more lies, lie upon lie upon lie uh, that he brings into our lives. And the Bible even talks about the strongholds that he can build up in our lives. Now, God has given us weapons that are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds, but you will never pull down a stronghold by trying to take on the enemy by yourself. This is how you fight your battles. You get in the position of warfare and you go to the one who has never lost a battle and say, Lord, deliver me. Deliver me. Only Jesus, only God, only the Holy Spirit can give us victory. And so we, for this reason, we bow our knees before the Father. He's able to tear down, and let me tell you, he's able to do more than that. He's not only able to tear down anything that the enemy has built up in your life, and by the way, he can do that tonight, but he can also overcome anything and give you complete and total victory. He is able to do more, able to do more. Look in verse 20 here where he says, Now to him who is able... We know God is able, but I love the way Paul puts it here. He said, who is able to what? Who is able to do far 
more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. This is what our God, yes, when we're praying, God answers our prayers. But let me tell you something. When you're at this position before the Lord, he not only does what you ask him to do, but he does things that you don't even know to ask him to do. He does even more. He brings even more into our lives. He, he gives us words of, of guidance, words of direction in our lives, and we don't even understand why. But when we obey him, he's leading us down a path of victory. He's leading us down a path of overcoming. And that, that's what he does. I had, I had an instance early this morning. I woke up and just some things that I, I, I'm praying through, and, and, and the enemy was kind of doing a, a, a number on me with that. With, uh, kind of doubting God in the midst of it. And that's what God told me as, I, as I'm praying and I'm interceding and saying, you know, God, why aren't things working out this way? Why, are, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And God just said very simply as I was praying before him, as I've taken this position, God spoke to my life and said, Doug, just trust me. Just trust me. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> See, sometimes we take the position mentally and physically, but we haven't really bowed the knee. <laughs> And so God put me in the position of truly bowing my knee before him. As I said, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. That's the position of warfare. You know, there was a time in my life when, uh, believe it or not, there was a time in my life when things were going pretty good. <laughs> a lot of times, you know, pre I, I share a lot about some of my struggles, don't always share about those good times, but this good time is going to lead to a struggle, okay? <laughs> but uh, uh, we were uh, having a season of revival at the church I was pastoring at that time, and, and we had uh, we'd seen some people saved, and, and God had led me during that time to, to, do, uh, to go through a season of fasting and praying. And, and, uh, and not only was God doing a, a great work in our church, He was doing a work in my life and in our family and giving me some victory over some things. And, and so I was just thinking the Lord uh, for that and stuff. And so as I was going in that position, I, I stood up kind of like I'm standing up right now. And I said, you know, things are going pretty, pretty good. And I started thinking, I said, you know, the devil has lost a lot of victories in my life. i tell you what, devil, you just bring it on. Now, listen, you don't have to be afraid of the devil. But what you don't want because of pride and ignorance, God to take his hand off it. And I had voiced out some pride that was in my heart. And before I knew it, I was back on my knees saying, God, I cannot do this. Help me. Help me. This is how we win the battle, the position of warfare. And then finally, let me just mention this, the position of intercession. Because that's really what this passage is, is, is focusing in on. He's, there is warfare there. There is worship there. But he's talking about our ministry to others. This is how you not only win the battles in your life, but this is how you win the battles in others' life. Paul mentions three requests here, three things. As he says, I'm on my knees. I bow my knees before the Father. And as he was praying for the Christians there in Ephesus, these are the three things he prayed for. First of all, he prayed that they would overcome through his strength. Look in verse 16. He, said, uh, he says there, and we just read it just a moment ago, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He's, he's praying that they would experience overcoming victory. He's praying that they would experience the, the strength of God in, in their life, that their experience would be one of victory. And of course, that is found through the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so that is what he's praying for. And where that takes place, that takes place in their hearts. That's, that's where uh, the, the, the victory is won there. And what will happen, that they will live out this faith, that they'll trust God, that they'll keep their, their surrender before God 
that they'll, they'll walk with God in the midst of, of everything that is going on. He's praying that for them. He's interceding for that. Do you know anybody who's, who's falling around you? Do you know anybody that's struggling around you? Let me tell you something. Paul has given us a, an avenue where we can, can go between God and them. That's what he says there uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in verse 16. He says, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you. And so here's Paul on his knees before God, interceding with his face in the dirt before them. And he's gotten between the people in Ephesus that need God and the God who will give it to them. And he's bringing them together for God to do a, a great work in their life, an overcoming work in their life. Do you have classmates that are struggling? Do you have family members that are struggling? Well, don't just complain to God about them. Don't just say a, a brief prayer. Get on your knees, on your face before God and begin to take that position of intercession and watch what God will do. That's the position of intercession. God, I can't do it. They don't want it. God, would you intervene and change their hearts? If they're saved, bring up that Holy Spirit within them that they will live a life of faith and not failure. Overcoming. And then the second request that he asks is that they will apprehend his love. It's crucial. It's crucial. He says there in verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength. Here it says to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That word comprehend literally means to apprehend. And understand what he's saying. It is good to pray, and I pray this. God just kind of changed my prayers. I was working through this passage of Scripture uh, just here recently, and that I have prayed many times that people will be apprehended by the love of God. Maybe you've prayed that, that God will grab a hold of them and show them his love. And that is a good prayer. But that's not what Paul prayed. Paul didn't pray that the love of God would apprehend them because the love of God's after them. I guarantee you that. He prayed that they would seize and take hold of the love of God. That's what he prayed for. That's the missing link and so many of our loved ones and people around us. I mean, God's working all around them, but they won't let go of this world and, and, and grab a hold. You say, well, they've got choices to make. Yes, they do. But Paul said, I'm not going to let that be an excuse. I'll tell you what I'm going to For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, and I pray that they will grab a hold of the love of God and never let go. That's the position of intercession. And then thirdly, he prays that they will be filled with all his fullness. You know, when I, it says there in verse 19, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And oftentimes when I, when I read that passage, and I've read that passage a number of times, as a matter of fact, I've written it out in my journaling Bible uh, when I've reading through the Bible and stuff there that I, I've put down. Lord, I want that. I want the fullness of God. You know what? Paul didn't say, I want the fullness of God. He said, I want you to have the fullness of God. I want you to have the fullness of God. And I want you to have the fullness of God. And I want you to have the fullness of God. He, he was praying for others that they would experience the fullness of God. You know why? Because Paul had the fullness of God. He wanted others to know God like he loved God. That's what God's calling us to. He's calling us to our knees. The position of worship, yes. But the position of warfare. So yes, we can experience the victory in our lives, but also the position of intercession so that we can see God bring victory in others' lives. 
You know, I'm, I'm thankful for this uh, rug that's up here because I've gotten on my knees a lot. But let me tell you something. When Paul was writing this letter, he wasn't writing it from a carpeted living room or from a lazy boy recliner. He's writing it from a prison cell. And with all these things going on around him, he says, for this reason, in spite of everything that has happened, I must bow my knees before the Father. Because he is worthy of my worship. He's the one, the only one that can bring me victory. And there are people people that need to know his fullness, that need to apprehend his love, that need to experience the power and the victory that is found in Christ. For this reason, I bow my knees before him. I want to encourage you tonight to take the position of worship. Come and get in this altar. Get on your knees before the Lord, right where you are if you need to. Say, Lord, I'm going I'm to worship you. I bow before you. I surrender all to you. I surrender my life to you. I encourage you to get on your knees in the position of warfare. You've been struggling. You will never find the victory until you get on your knees before the Lord. I encourage you to get on your knees position of intercession let's touch heaven for the souls and the lives of those around us that is where ministry takes place on our names this is Doug Ferris and I'm blessed to be the pastor here at Underwood Baptist Church. I want to thank you for listening to our podcast. It's our prayer that you'll do more than listen to the sermon or gather religious information. We want you to encounter God, and we pray that He will impact your life. If you'd like to contact us for any reason, please go to our website at underwoodbaptist.org. All our contact information is there, and we look forward to hearing from you. I hope you are blessed by today's message.